Hi everyone. I think it's 12 o'clock, so we're gonna start. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, there are like eight sessions in parallel, so <laughs> we, we do have some competition, so it's really great to see uh, so many faces. My name is Paula, I work uh, with the European Journalism Center, and that's how I got to meet all these brilliant uh, professionals here. Uh, and yeah, we have several projects at the EJC uh, to talk about innovation, but more recently and more specifically about newsroom change in terms of culture and people management and well-being. So we think that these topics are really important, so I'm really, really happy that we uh, could bring Al, Sousa, Christian and Anita together to discuss them in Perugia. And yeah, I'll just leave you with the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, for the uh, introductory words. So uh, thanks for, for being here. Um, the title of our panel is uh, How Life in the Newsroom Is or Should Be Changing. By that title, you can already see that there are opinions on that stage, and there will be opinions on that stage that think that it should actually be changing more than it uh, currently is, and that there are cultural um, topics that we, as an industry, um, have to work on um, to be um, innovative and to make life in our newsrooms um, better for the people who work in them. Um, I'm excited to uh, see again some, some friends on this panel who all of them um, have very interesting opinions and uh, very interesting CVs to talk about um, that, that topic of culture change uh, in, in newsrooms. Um, welcome Susanna Ziometska, who uh, is the founder and editor-in-chief of News Mavens. Welcome Christian Lupcha, who is the founder and editor of Decat or Revista, and I'm sure That's I didn't... <laughs> pronounced that <laughs> in, entirely right. I'm sorry for that. No, that's perfect. And welcome to Alex Entwistle, who is the assistant editor, BBC Radio 5 Live. And my name is Anita Zilina, and I'm the director of innovation and leadership at the Craig Newmark J School in New York. So we decided we won't spend uh, too much time theoretically telling you guys that we all think culture change is important, because we assume that um, if the audience sits here, then there is a certain commitment um, and a certain shared understanding. And we thought that probably the best way um, to get the discussion going um, and uh, to make it productive for everyone here is to really practically dive into the topics and, say, and figure out you know, what, are, what are ways to drive that change, what are obstacles that we encountered, um, and how did we overcome um, these obstacles. We will have like a 40 minute or so uh, discussion and then we'll open it up to questions uh, from the audience and we'd really love to get a discussion going here as well. Um, so let's maybe start uh, with exactly that, um, that question. Um, we all work or worked in newsrooms, big or small, organizations that we funded, founded ourselves or organizations that have existed long before um, us as leaders. Um, how do you one, question one, did you guys encounter discussions around culture and leadership? And if not, how did you guys, or how do you guys in your newsrooms ensure that this is a topic that is being talked about? How do you bring that to the agenda in a time when, uh, you know, everyone is kind of stressed out with the operational, with the daily operations of the newsroom and, you know, feeling there is so much else to do and I think Culture sometimes, the topic of culture has this tendency of kind of fall down as, oh, yes, eventually we need to talk about that, but not now we are too busy. Mm. Do we, Alex, do you want to start maybe? Yeah, I, um, so I worked for the BBC and it was an organization corporation way before I started and I've only been, I would say, an official leader in my position for two years. Um, I think leadership and culture has become increasingly more important definitely over the past couple of years at our place of work because it's been just a crazy couple of years for news uh, attacks across Europe uh, the Manchester bomb we're based in Salford which is just next door to Manchester so that was really close to home for us the London terror attacks Brexit <coughs> ongoing uh, Donald Trump and it became clear that culture and uh, care in the workplace was really important because those stories are just not stopping and news keeps on breaking and we could see that with our staff um, 
we needed to, to improve things and think more about their welfare than just, okay, we've got to broadcast this, we've got to publish that. So I would say workplace culture and looking after members of staff in the past couple of years. Closer. Is that better? Um, it's, it's just become a lot more important and, um, yeah, I mean, I would say that it's forefront at our place in the BBC. Five Live is only a section of the BBC uh, based in the north of England, so I know that culture is on the menu right across the BBC, but that's in our place of work. Okay, Susanna? Um, there's no such thing as discussion about culture in most newsrooms that I've encountered. And that's a great opportunity. In fact, perhaps instead of talking about it, we can start working on it. This was uh, the approach I took with my small team. I have a core team within Gazeta Wyborcza in Warsaw. And then we have about 30 women all over the region who contribute to news mavens. And in order to make sure that culture was a topic that's on the table, this is something that's worked for me. Um, we have a quarterly debriefing meeting in which I ask my team to go over the things that they think worked best, to talk about the things that didn't work well and how we can make sure they improve in the future. But these two questions, they're just warm-ups to get my team thinking constructively about our work. The most important question I ask them is the last one. Okay, what did I do that helped you most? And what did I do that was the most disruptive for you? And I find that letting people, encouraging them to be open about how leadership is failing <coughs> and how we are succeeding is one of the, has been a very important trigger in my team to make sure that they understand that there's an openness to discuss this. And that brings up a lot of issues. And they're hard to hear sometimes. Very hard to hear. Like when they tell me, oh, Zoo, we love it. You're, you're, you're so meta level and you're so inspiring. And you're talking about the concepts. And we're all on board and we're doing our work. And then once in a while, you swoop down and focus on something really micro. And we're, that's so disorienting for us. Please don't do that. And I love doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I would do that with a sense of great accomplishment that I'm getting my hands dirty and I'm helping the team. I thought I was being helpful. Turns out I was not. And by, um, it's important to have a sense of humor about these things. <laughs> um, but once they, my team realized that I'm open, they became much more vocal about where the boundary of their commitment and their comfort levels are. So that's one of the things that has worked for me. Thanks for sharing that. Hi, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm just going to go in a different direction than Zeus, although I completely agree with her and face the same challenges. Uh, my, uh, my team, uh, we come from a sort of a startup background. We started 10 years ago with an independent quarterly uh, nonfiction magazine because we wanted to do something that was different than what was available on the Romanian market in terms of uh, journalism and mostly long-form nonfiction storytelling. And um, when you're in a sort of a startup, entrepreneurial culture, we were five friends that built something and we were overusing a word that I stray away from now, uh, right now, which is family. Uh, so we were trying to build something and for the first four or five years, culture was, I don't think the word has ever come up. It was, I think survival was the word that was uh, on, uh, on our minds most of the time. So how do we make money to put out the next issue? Can we start paying contributors? Can we actually make this work? So we never thought about the fact that while we were doing all of this, we were creating organizational culture. And I think that was one of the things that has struck me at one point, and this is the thing that I've been telling newsrooms that start up, like the first one or two years, they're just so exciting with the change and the hustle and trying to make things work. And the first moment you'll have a chance to, you know, 
get out of the day-to-day -day grind, you'll realize you have a culture there, and it might be a culture that encourages the work that you do, or it might be a culture that makes it difficult. So what, what has happened to us uh, about five years ago is that the survival thing wasn't going well, and we had a terrible crash. And there was, out of eight people that we have gathered at that point, eight, ten people, there was three of us left. So we had to start building everything again from scratch. Uh, and I have a, I've always had a personal passion for uh, how we work, so work has interested me very much. And I don't know how much you follow discussions about how people work, but organizations are changing, not just in journalism, and changing seriously. Uh, and there's this whole spectrum of evolutionary organizations that talks about self-management and autonomy and uh, growth and uh, care, as, as Alex said. Uh, which, if we're honest, sounds very antithetical to the way newsrooms are set up, which are very critical, very, even inside the newsroom, very skeptical, very combative. Um, so I said, okay, now that we almost died and have a chance to reinvent ourselves, can we try to be that kind of organization and also do journalism? Uh, so I remember in 2016 when we last moved, um, I told my team then, how about this is a, a new start? And we're not just gonna do great stories, we're also gonna try to be the place where people can do the best work uh, that they can do. So part of our mission here is not just to uh, put out great work, but to encourage people to do that. And we've been trying to figure out how to do that part of the job over the past three years, and that has involved slowly creating the kind of mechanisms that also uh, Zuza was, was talking about. So the, the one big thing that we started that is still ongoing, we have a monthly check-in meeting with everyone, and everyone now is 25 people. So something is working in, in our approach. So we have a, a monthly meeting that is called the State of, of Door, where we actually talk about not just the projects that are going on, but also about how people are feeling, what are we doing, are we moving too fast? So, uh, and I'll end this on this short example to give you a sense of where this meeting sometimes goes. I sense that our staff was really uh, close to a burnout last, last fall, so we had, uh, I gave everyone post-it notes so they wouldn't have to shout it out, and I asked them, out of all the many projects we do, and as they said in a previous panel, out of all the chicken shit projects that we get involved in in journalism, if you had the chance to do this, which one would you kill? And they were like, you really want us to say which project we would kill? And I said, I, yeah, because as an editor, you sometimes <laughs> think you have to do everything. So we gathered up all, all the post-its, and the one that got the most votes, it's, it was a project that strategically would have been really bad for us to kill, which I realized this one is one that we have not communicated well enough. Uh, and we did kill a couple of projects out of the ones that were on those post-it notes. So those are, that's how we learn from each other and try to build a culture where people can speak up about things that work and don't. Thanks for, for sharing that example. So when I think about conversations on culture and leadership in newsrooms, one thing, and I worked in pretty legacy organizations, both uh, NZZ Media Group as well as uh, Gruner and Jahr and Stern Magazine have been around for a while and have a pretty, let's say, solid understanding of this is how we do things and this is how we don't do things. So the culture change part of my role uh, was, was essential and, and, and time and energy consuming, of course, as well. And one thing that I encountered is that uh, I think there is a certain tendency, uh, especially in legacy newsrooms, to, s to feel that creating this transparency, sharing stories about failure, being open to feedback, uh, talking about becoming better as leaders, is perceived as weakness. And is perceived as something that's kind of fluffy and like emotional and touchy-feely, you know, not business. So I see, I think we are kind of a, sometimes a pretty cynic, cynical bunch of people as journalists. So I feel that one thing that I encountered often when I pushed for you know, culture initiatives, so leadership initiatives, um, was basically a kind of a cynicism in terms of, yeah, well, we should focus on work and not those kind of emotional thingies beside that. Is that something that you guys can relate with? Uh, well, speaking from inside. Not wanting to put the BBC on the spot, yeah, but I think no. it's in a lot of 
a lot of uh, existing legacy organisations. Um, I can't talk for the whole of the BBC, <laughs> but um, yeah, definitely I've, I've, I've seen that um, over the past 10 years. The change has been really massive because it is more, certainly at Five Live, more about being empathetic and emotional and those things which I definitely think in the last five years I've seen a change in leadership where it's not those hardliners, you know, we've got these targets, I don't care how long you have to work, I don't care if you're on the verge of burnout, I don't care if you're struggling. That's changed completely. Um, and I, I've seen that across, you know, with the News Impact Network, that seems to be the way that things are going now because at the end of the day, if you're not looking after your members of staff, the work that they produce is going to be a lower level. And I think it's our duty as leaders or as colleagues to make sure that you are looking after everyone. Mm. And again, in the past couple of years, a comment like that would have probably made a lot of people's eyes roll back and think, oh, here we go. You know, this is the work in Nirvana which we'll never reach and it's just <laughs> lip service towards um, people's feelings. But I definitely think it's, it's made a difference and I've seen a change. Mm. But I would say that legacy organisations... It, it takes a long time to change that mindset, whether it's the size of a corporation or a business and how long it's been established for. Mm. You really need to start small and hopefully when people see the benefits of those groups, um, they'll start to change as well. Susa, you want to add something? Yes, I think um, I bring a Polish perspective to the table. And what's happened in Polish politics has also affected Polish media. Um, mainly because the current ruling government is not so interested in maintaining a pure democratic rule. They're interested in weakening a lot of the institutions and taking and centralizing power. And what that means for a daily newspaper whose DNA is actually grounded in supporting democratic elections, like Gazeta Wyborcza, it means that it becomes personal. Um, and in the battle between the government and the newspaper, the newspaper has taken a lot of casualties. Um, a lot of those involve advertisers who are discouraged or outright blocked from supporting the paper. What this means is that there has been a crisis, a financial crisis, that this very motivated, idealistic, um, very professional team has been faced with the necessity to cut back. And the team has gotten so much smaller. And the amount of work has gotten so much bigger. And so you have leadership that is fighting for survival, like leadership and care. We have been a very tough group of people. I did um, a workshop on bias and burnout for some top execs from the media at the Reuters Institute some time ago. And there was a gentleman from an, intern from an international legacy corporation who after I had spent an hour and a half explaining how burnout affects your capacity to perform and how it impacts, it can potentially negatively impact your talent pool. He said, yeah, yeah, very interesting, very interesting. But you know, journalists need to be tough. And that was the comment, journalists need to be tough because this is kind of how we see ourselves. We have to be able to, in order to speak truth to power, we have to be able to have balls, to be resilient, and it's kind of part of the package. And admitting that you're struggling means that perhaps you're not cut out for the job. That's the fear. And that's the challenge that leadership faces in communicating that actually we need to survive and your well-being is part of that survival process. And I've watched something interesting happen at Gazeta Wyborcza. I'm sorry if I'm speaking too long. No, no, continue. Um, <laughs> there was an editor who climbed the ranks and became deputy editor-in-chief. We have this historic, iconic editor who is not to be moved and will never be moved. So the actual day-to-day -day executive functions fall to the deputies, there's four. And one of them was this guy who just, he, he doesn't let go. He's, lot, he's dedicated his entire life to saving this paper. And he became publishing director, which doesn't always happen. Usually publishers come from the business side, from the sales side. But suddenly there's an editor who is a publisher. 
And he was one of these old school, hardball journalists who would yell at everyone and would kind of barrel into meetings and destroy projects right at the end and reinvent them. It was very harsh, very direct, very stressed, but very effective. And what happened was he started promoting women to work with him. And I'm not saying this is a recipe for everyone, but what I've seen happen is that now that this guy has surrounded himself with strategic allies who are women, his leadership style has dramatically changed. And it has become much more delicate, much more attuned to proper communication and um, soft skills. Mm. So I think a crisis gives a tremendous opportunity to change things that have always been a certain way. When things are falling apart anyway, this is a wonderful opportunity to set them up differently for the future. And, and that's, that's a good point. And I think you, you made that point as well. And I think, um, I think uh, to, to Alex's point, um, I, I share the optimism that I see a change in the debate. So what makes me optimistic about that is that I see that these hardliners, like you called them, there are plenty of us um, who are, you know, kind of mid-level management or even higher management who are not willing to accept anymore that being a good editor-in-chief means shouting at people, that don't yeah. accept that being a good journalist means being grumpy and kind of self-destructive uh, in a way, that don't accept um, that diversity is not an issue in our newsroom. So I feel that sounds a bit um, religious and maybe that's kind of the <laughs> surrounding here that makes me say that. But um, what I do see is a certain movement of uh, people and that makes me happy <laughs> that are just not willing to accept um, anymore um, that uh, workplace culture is the way it's supposed to be in newsrooms. And one thing um, that I do see, and you mentioned new work, and I'd like to dive into that a little bit more. One thing that I do see, I, I was in the lucky position to hire quite a few people um, over the last uh, years or so in different roles. And I saw that people who I hired, who often were, call it millennials or whatever, that's <laughs> confusing word, but kind of in the early 30s or mid 30s, they just had different wishes um, and uh, different aspirations um, than what usually HR would probably think are things that people care about. So they didn't care about you know, getting the company car, but they cared about part-time work and childcare and um, parental leave policies, and they cared about collaboration, and they cared about professional development and having a growth trajectory in the organization. Is that something that you guys um, also see? Is that something, how do you deal in your organization with this development? Uh, well, I, I just want to add one example because I, even in Romania, I had the same experiences as, as Zuzo was talking about and as you mentioned uh, earlier, at the beginning of this year, a really respected editor from a big legacy organization came to our newsroom to speak to a couple of us on the management team and one of the things he remarked on was, uh, that he realized in the past year that it's no longer okay to shout at your staff, that they get pissed <laughs> off. Uh, and I understand where he's coming from. I grew up in that kind of an, in that kind of an organization, and, it was, he's, and I understand when he says, this is how it's always been for me. It was sort of natural that editors would shout at me, and, uh, and then I would shout at the people that uh, were uh, working for me, and that's how it always worked, but now, my staff no longer takes that and they leave. I'm like, okay, that's, that's a step, that's a step, uh, that's a step forward. Uh, and unfortunately, this tension between the need to produce journalism, the need to make journalism sustainable and building culture is huge. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like we have stress periods where sometimes maybe care goes out the window without us, uh, without us wanting to. But the ideal is to get to the uh, kind of organization that Anita was, uh, was um, uh, talking about and encouraging this kind of development. Uh, so one thing that we do is, or one thing that I do when I talk to our, our, our staff is ask them where they want to be and not necessarily in the organization. Uh, so for me, it's perfectly fine if someone's mission in life transcends what we want to do. Uh, as long as we can sail on the same 
boat for a couple of years, if this gets them closer to their mission, and if th this uh, fits together with our mission as well, that's perfect. So uh, we've been told that it's very weird that when someone leaves our organization, and we had some very key people leave in the past half year because one of them wanted to work in poverty relief, the other one wanted to move into the corporate world and try consulting. This was our fundraiser and our uh, business operations manager. We wrote these lengthy posts on uh, Facebook about what they meant to us and where they're going, and I got a lot of private messaging saying, aren't you pissed that they're leaving? <laughs> Like, what would this get me? And I think the survival of our organization is also based upon building these kind of networks that are gonna give something back to you at some point. If you are there for them, they will be there for you when you, uh, w w when you struggle. So I, I highly encourage uh, all of you who get to work with people or, or, or manage people to not, not treat them like they owe you their uh, life. Uh, they owe you some things and ideally you make those things as specific as possible. And sometimes because it's journalism, they might owe you more weekends than or more nights than they're willing to put in in other, uh, in, in other fields. That is the complicated transaction. Uh, but help them figure out wh what they're best at. It's, it's not easy and it's hard to lose people, but it's a good, I think it's a good thing to, to do. Um, yeah, I just want to kind of echo that. I've, again, with the change in management style over the past five years, I've definitely seen, and myself with our team, is it's, it's more about elevating the potential and helping people reach their potential, and whether that's in your department, in your business, or elsewhere, um, I think you get a lot more back from your colleagues and your team if you're trying to help them reach their goals, it's, um, it's something that I've noticed mm. definitely across Five Live. It's not, oh, that's the best worker. We need to keep them. We're not going to let you go for that job interview. It's very much, okay, you, you deserve it. You're great at your job. Go and be the best that you can be. Uh, I have coached people to leave my team twice because they were awesome writers. They were these young women with tremendous talent and they were working on um, on an online version of a women's supplement to Gazeta Viborcha. We were the digital team and they were mainly publishing stories online or writing quick stories for online and then they were burning the midnight oil doing the stuff that they love and I coached two of them to leave and they have now, both of them, they're on their second book. And they're really growing in the direction that they love. And I think it's, I think it makes sense to do that because there is a danger with millennials. The danger is that, I'm sorry. The danger is that they're also the most likely to burn out. It turns out that young people um, who don't have a very um, complex family life. They do, they're not taking care of kids. They're not, they tend to overinvest in their work. So they, they put all their eggs in the work basket. And they're also coming in with a lot of ideas about what the work will be like and what their impact will be like and how awesome it will be to change the world as a journalist. So they're coming in with their expectations here and reality is here. And if they've got nothing else that's really important for them in their life, then that difference is going to make them hate their job, hate you, and do lousy work. Mm. So I agree with my colleagues that it's really important to know what's important to them and finding alignment between what they love to do and want to do and making sure that they they get as much of that from their workplace, that's gonna get you the most results. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have to take care of them and make sure that they're not crossing lines that will be very difficult to back away from. Let's dive a little <coughs> bit into exactly this topic of stress, burnout, and on the other hand, resilience, and how to build resilience for yourself to kind of stay sane and healthy as a leader in this stressful transformation phase. 
but also how do we ensure um, that our teams stay sane and healthy. And I'd like us to share some, some experiences or some best practices or some things that didn't work um, that, we, that we worked on. So maybe, do you want to start, Christian? This is, uh, this is a complicated uh, one when you sort of uh, try to juggle everything. Um, the things we have found, I'm not saying they're working, they're things that we're, we're trying, is that we're, we have a pretty flexible uh, policy in terms of uh, uh, how people can, can work. Um, so we don't make people come in at a certain time or on every day as long as they, they, um, they do their work. So it's complicated with the response because telling people that they can do this is sometimes they don't believe you. Uh, so having, you really have, as a, as, a, as a manager, one of the things that has surprised me the most is how often you need to say the same, how often you need to say the same things over and over and over again. The, uh, and that means calling out the things that don't work, but it, it means mostly calling out the things that you need to make work because building culture means uh, repeating the behaviors that you want um, people to uh, to have. So in, in, in terms of, you know, making people take advantage of, you know, flexible time, is you have to reinforce this that they don't have, if, if they see some of their colleagues having long days or they don't need to do the same. We'll, we'll try to build an open culture where you can, you don't need to feel guilty if you don't show up for two days and then, and Slack channel looks like a Christmas tree and uh, like, oh, they're working and I'm maybe reporting or maybe taking a day off or taking it easier. So managing that guilt is actually not, not easy. It, it, like it, on, on the face of it, mm -hmm. it sounds like, oh, cool, I can you know, come in whenever I, I want or to take a break. It's, it's not as easy. So for me, it was a learning curve of, okay, I need to find time or make a sp space to explain to people that we can actually mm -hmm. Um, that we can actually do this. So this is one. This is one thing we're we're doing, letting people sort of own their um, own their work. I don't. The other things that we are doing is we're trying to expose the staff to more and more. I wouldn't call them trainings because we haven't done things that are very. Um, I don't know over a length of time, but we're bringing in people that talk about uh, communications. We did a. We had a one-day retreat where we talked about the neuroscience of communication and understanding how we impact each other in the way we communicate and how what the types of communicators each of us in the newsroom is. And that helps because it creates that kind of trust where you then can voice uh, the, the, the things that don't go well. Um, one other thing that we're, we're doing at, at least to sort of surface whatever is on people's minds is this uh, exercise that we picked up from these wonderful uh, psychiatrists that start, uh, started an organization in New York called Narrative, and they work on listening. That's their main uh, focus. So they talk about storytelling and the importance of the importance of listening and storytelling. So we've picked up something that we do at the beginning of our management meetings, but also some of the, uh, the larger meetings, where we go around the room and everyone shares what is preventing them from being present in that moment? And that's when, uh, that's when you realize that you might think someone is not there or disengaged or not paying attention, but then you hear their parents are in the hospital, they're having trouble with their relationship, they're, uh, I don't know, the, their bank has, uh, has uh, you know, closed their account. So that's a way to surface the things that are heavily impacting our work and that we don't even say over coffee in, in the morning, mm. but in sort of in that space when, where everyone shares. Uh, so at least that's, that's a way to surface that kind of tension and then, uh, which is something I do and my other colleagues who manage people do, is actually force people to just get out of the office. Or, uh, I, had, our, I had to tell our distribution manager that our relationship is gonna be in peril if she doesn't disappear for a week. Uh, and thankfully she did. Uh, and then she said, oh, you were right. Like my brain was fried. <laughs> so 
it's, it's a weird thing to do as, mm -hmm. as a manager, but I think a really important one. Susan. Um, I'm going to start with what we can do to help ourselves, because if we're fried, <laughs> then we might not notice that everyone else around us is struggling. And I think it's, um, this is very common sense, but it needs to be said. We need confidence. We need to be able to talk to people who are having, who understand who we are and what we're trying to do, and who will listen to us in a way that's non judgmental and that's helpful. Because if we don't download, if we don't data dump, we're also not going to be able to make sense of everything that's happening. It's much more difficult to do that for yourself if you don't have a contemplative practice. Um, so having confidence is important. My confidant is my dad. He's sitting in row two. Um, Hi, Dad. <laughs> it helps that he's an editor, so that he understands the context of what I'm saying. Um, the contemplative practice is not a joke. I teach mindfulness-based stress reduction, and I find that having a technique that forces you to spend time looking at the inside of your own head is very helpful because if we're not aware of what's in the spin cycle, then we are being driven by things that we did not choose. We are, being, we are carrying emotions into the workplace that are affecting our behavior, that are affecting our leadership style. We are not at our best when our brains <coughs> are triggered by a stress response. What actually happens on a neurological level is that we, our brain unplugs the part responsible for communication, problem solving, and memory, and that energy goes into a physical response to enable us to fight or flight, which means that our greatest resources are offline when we're stressed out. So if we don't have a way of dealing with stress, I think that's a problem. Mindfulness is my way. There are others. And what I find that works for me and that I also recommend and make sure that my team makes use of is not just leaving the office to go home, but conferences. The thing about conferences is that they're full of confidants. Mm. People who know um, the kind of problems that we're struggling with which is a tremendously important thing. If you feel understood that you're not the only person in the world who's dealing with this stuff, that in itself gives you energy. Wow. Well, <laughs> welcome. OK. Um, Thank god you have a loud voice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no one said anything. The other thing about conferences is that it allows you to take a step away from your work, your daily work, and see it from a distance. Um, you see it in the questions that people ask you. You see it in how it fits into the ecosystem of what other people are doing. And it's easier to find when people tell you that your work is important or interesting or exciting, it's easier to believe that or to remember that again. So I find that going to conferences is, um, gives me a lot of strength and renews my energy, and it does that also for my people. I make sure that they go, that they get the experience of listening to other people and talking to them about what we're doing, and they always come back so energized. So That's thank great. you for giving me that energy, everybody. <laughs> Alex. Um, so there are a few things, like Christian said, as, as far as um, making sure you know how your team are, I know Susan's a fan of this. So we've got something called uh, the mood jukebox. It's not really a jukebox. Um, sometimes people don't want to share how they're feeling, but it will affect their day-to-day -day work. And all the jukeboxes, it's just a piece of paper with some record covers on our whiteboard. And um, rather than people explaining what they're going through, it might be personal, it might be health, it might be a family issue, it might be that they were late to work and they got stuck in traffic. And they choose a song um, according to how they're feeling. So let's say, um, you know, you might have Nina Simone feeling good, Coldplay trouble, uh, dazed and confused, Led Zeppelin. You can pick what you want on how you're feeling. 
And then as a leader, depending on what people pick, it's your judgment that you can use whether you go and speak to that person separately. If they feel comfortable, they'll open up and say, I'm struggling today because this contributor's not got back to me. This deadline's looming. Or do you know what? I'm well ahead of my targets so I can help anyone else. So that's really helped us as a team without giving too much information away if it's something personal that's affecting their uh, work to just have a judgment of how every, everyone's feeling that day. Um, what I do to look after myself, I absolutely love the Headspace app. Again, I'm, I'm pretty new to it, and a couple of years ago, I would have scoffed at the idea of like, oh, mindfulness, yeah, yeah, that's going to help. <laughs> but um, taking breaks is really important. There's, we've got a saying on the desk, you, you're in the screen. We've all been there. You're working so long on a document, on an edit, on a written piece, and you get to a certain stage where you just turn into a slug, and you've got no chance of getting that work finished. And walking away from the desk and taking a break, whether it's a walk outside, 10 minutes, a proper dinner break, is just so helpful and re-energizes you to come back and start again. That's something that I found really helps myself. But again, you've got to lead by example. So if you've got a team who are doing that, you can talk all you want about these techniques. But unless you do them yourself and make sure that others, that you're encouraging your team to do them, um, it's pointless. So taking a break has, has really helped me. No, that's, thanks, thanks to all of you for being so open and sharing and maybe to, before we open it up um, for questions, uh, to questions from the audience, um, building on leading by example, sharing some things that I learned. And I think it's important to say, I, I made, a, like probably all of us, a lot of mistakes when I started my, my journey as a leader, just because it doesn't really, not everything comes natural. Um, to, to everyone. So I think the mistakes that I made were partly things, just not realizing how much you lead by example. So if, if you enter a room grumpy just because maybe your commute was you know, stressful or I don't know, something uh, went wrong at home, that has an impression. Uh, on the team, so I learned that it's really important as a leader. You don't have to constantly run around smiling and saying, you know, everything's great. But I think being aware that your expression does something with the team, that is something that I really learned. Also, some things that I, um, I mean, I literally had a very bad boss once who, whenever someone took vacation, said a sentence that was approximately like, Oh, well, you're lucky, two weeks vacation again. Oh, you know what that does to the team? Because there is constantly this feeling of this is a socially not appreciated behavior to take time off. And I'm sure this boss, well, I assume this boss didn't necessarily mean it that way. But that is the impression that you create. So kind of being aware of the impressions that you create, I think I found something that I really try to focus on right now. And then there is little things like no weekend emails. That is just something very practical that I found had a big impact. I just stopped sending emails on Sunday unless there was kind of an emergency happening on Sunday. But no, oh, you know, when you come back to the office on Monday, let's discuss this or that. What it does in the brain of the person, you know, you sent this email to, he or she will spend their Sunday thinking like, oh my God, did I prepare well for this meeting? Is this going to be stressful? Should I you know, do something right now? Can I enjoy my glass of rosé in the sun or do I have to sit down and kind of prepare? Which maybe wasn't your intention, but that's what happened. So I think it's the little gestures like this. And then the last thing that I'd like to add is, and I see that, unfortunately, I don't see that happen too often, but I think it's so important. It's something you touched upon. Little humane gestures. <laughs> I think we sometimes forget that there are human beings involved in the workplace. So if someone goes through a hard time just saying, well, you don't have to worry about figuring out how many days you take off or you don't have to worry about you know, being away, visiting your mom in the hospital or something like that. I just feel whenever a boss I encounter does that, it creates a level of trust in the organization <laughs> That is really valuable because trust is ultimately what you what you built on in an organization. Just some thoughts. Um, yeah, let's maybe open it up for questions uh, from the audience. There's one back there. Yeah. Hey. <laughs>
great question. Um, we, we were talking about this last night, and I think it's, again, getting to know your team and working out what each people, uh, what each person wants and how they react best to the direction that you give them. So we were talking about some people like to be given a target and you can leave them to it and that's it. And then there are other people who like lots and lots of detail and want everything structured for them to follow out to the, to the letter. And I think that's really helped me realising the, the people in our team, what side they, they lie on. And it, no, it might not necessarily reflect yourself because one of the things that we, we were talking about last night is when that, when that person or when members of your team aren't the same as you, it's quite easy to give them direction in what you would want but not the level of detail that they get. Um, but if there is somebody who's, who's not pulling the weight and perhaps pushing back, it, it's really important to deal with that straight away. And it's a really frank conversation about taking the person out of it and the effect that it's having on the team. So rather than making it a personal issue, you present the facts in because this is happening the rest of the team is like that you need to take the person out of it so that would be that would be my tip for dealing with difficult people or somebody who's not quite fitting in with the ethos that you want yeah, uh, I'm on board. but what do you do sir when you have a real burned out case yeah if you have someone who just cannot perform an excellent mm. stuffer who starts blowing deadlines coming up with ever stranger excuses and then you see that's probably a burnout and your tough lecture is actually making the issue worse. Mm. Um, How do you help such person? So one of, the, one of the benefits with the BBC is that there are a great HR and medical stat health uh, professionals on hand so we can uh, refer those people they're outside the BBC, the medical professionals, but um, as far as mental health goes, that is, that is really important. There's a process to go through where they can be referred, they can get counselling. Um, that's definitely happened, not, not on our team, but within uh, Media City where Five Lives based. There are a lot of, of teams there. Um, it was after the Manchester attacks because a lot of people... It, it was it was burnout because it was a massive story. It was on our doorstep, and um, it was right around the clock. So I'm not going to deny that there's not burnout, and those things need dealing with. But yeah, we're we're lucky as the BBC to have those people on hand and a process to go through. I'd like to add to that um, because there's there is a way to help people who are dealing with having. <coughs> a work overload. And one of those things is rest. And I say this with a smile because from a neurological perspective, what happens to the brain of somebody who's burned out is almost exactly the same as what happens to a person after trauma. And to get your brain back in balance, neurologists say that you need four weeks of rest. But the other problem with burnout is that it's not just about being tired, it's also there's a value, it's an existential crisis at work, basically, which means you need help talking about it. And, it. and if you're lucky to be in an organization that has thought of this already, then you know who, how to direct your people. But for everyone else, there is also a resource that there isn't a culture of using um, in the media, particularly in the news, but coaching. Coaches are people who are trained to talk you through the problems you're having at work and to help you arrive at solutions. And even though we're not used to referring people to coaches, I think in the case of burnout that might be helpful because something needs to change to make sure that that person doesn't arrive in that same burned out place again. Great point. I'll, I'll add one quick thing to this and not necessarily about burnout, but maybe just and piggybacking on the first question, maybe it's just a case of things aren't working for some reason and you know that one staffer's behavior might be escalating in a way that creates conflict and we've dealt with this uh, a few times in, in, in the past couple of years that people had you know they were tired started blowing deadlines coming up with 
all sorts of excuses. Uh, and what has helped us a lot in this process is that we have multiple projects going on. So we have the first thing that we try to do is move someone to a different project in a completely different uh, role with other with another pace with different responsibilities and it sounds simple but it's it still is a complicated decision uh, to make and a complicated conversation within the management uh, within our management team because sometimes helping someone from the outside looks like you're giving them a break which is what you are uh, but then sometimes that break follows a string of what might be called bad behavior, which also has, as Zuza well pointed out, has, uh, you know, has, does, does damage. So we have asked ourselves the question, like, does, when is, what's the difference between helping somebody and rewarding bad behavior with making their life easier? And there is no easy answer to this question. Uh, so what's been hard for me and also for my uh, uh, colleagues who are sort of also trying to learn how to be better managers is try to put the responsibility on us, first of all. Uh, and that is complicated. If you, come from in, if you come into management from editing, you're like, yeah, we had one, uh, I don't know, our relationship was based on you making your deadline. So if that was your relationship with the reporter as an editor, as a manager to be able to say, well, it might be whatever the structures and culture we created that has also impacted your per performance. So it is on me to try to uh, also find ways for you to do something. So that's what we've, we've done. We've moved people and I think we have, uh, I can think of three cases where a very easy sort of old school solution would have been, it's time to part ways and uh, our people just completely reinvented themselves just because they were able to slip under the radar, get that rest that they needed, get new, st uh, get new stimuli in their life, produce different things without the same pressure and it's worked. So I would, that's one thing I would encourage yeah. all of you to try. I think we have a, another question over there. Um, yeah, it's great to hear talk about creating more supportive newsrooms and thinking about staff welfare more. Um, I was wondering, because you've all mentioned quite a lot, you know, how leaders deal with these challenges and how management teams deal with these challenges. How do you think you can address some of these issues in a non-hierarchical newsroom where you're kind of working across a team of people who all have the kind of same status? Really appreciate any thoughts on that. <laughs> That's the kind of newsroom that we're trying to create. Uh, and I don't know, sometimes I hide behind the fact that, hey, it's a cultural issue in Central and Eastern Europe and in Romania, we're very used to hierarchy, so people naturally gravitate to hierarchy. Uh, so it's, it's, it's difficult because we are trying to empower either various teams or various groups of people to make their own decisions. Uh, and I think journalism is, especially now, since everything is so fragile and vulnerable, uh, the teams do come up with great ideas or great things to do or with proposals, but they always turn to whoever looks to be in charge because it all might fall down at any moment. So they're like, we have this idea, but I know we don't have money. I know we don't have resources. I know we don't have time. So can we really try this? Uh, so the only thing I can say is just that it's constant conversation for, for me personally and this has been, I'm coming from a place just like Zeus, I love the big uh, meta discussion, I love the big challenges of trying to create the, the newsrooms but I always love, I love editing stories and I, and I, and I you know, I love being within, at the sentence level at the same time. Uh, so trying to juggle this and just stepping away and creating an environment, not where we would fail, but where some projects just don't, uh, don't work. But the complicated thing there is you need to create an organization where you have some pillars that, will, that can't fall down no matter what, and then create some other places where it, mm. it doesn't matter. It might be important, but if it doesn't work, it just doesn't work. Maybe to, to, to add one thought to that, there is a, a whole concept uh, around 
the word lateral leadership. And basically, I think one thing to keep in mind is you don't have to necessarily be the hierarchical leader to have a leadership role. I think we all know um, experiences in meetings or you know, getting together with groups where we feel there is someone who is supposed to be the hierarchical leader, but someone else is kind of the real leader in the conversation because so that kind of people look up to him or her and look kind of expect them to guide um, the discussion. And I think that is actually also something great because what one question that I hear often is, well, I'm not in a management role, so what can I do to change things in our organization? Because the guys on top, and it's mostly guys, um, the guys on top, they don't want to change. And one thing that I found is you can actually do quite a lot to, to install a different way of approaching leadership and then working on culture, even if you're not on the hierarchical leadership level, a lot of the things that I mentioned before around kind of humane acts uh, and around behavior, I think these apply to everyone in a newsroom. If your colleague comes in grumpy every day, that does something to you as well. Of course, it's worse if your boss comes in grumpy every day, but I mean, it, it is like a very similar thing. We maybe have time for one more question. Wait, can I just throw one thing in? Yes, of course. There is a definition of leadership that I really like. I find that people use leadership and management and being the boss and being a leader, that it's kind of interchangeable a lot of times, but there, mm. is, there are actually distinctions between yeah. these two approaches. And one of the definitions that I vibe with the most comes from um, the Harvard Kennedy School of Public Leadership. And it was devised by these two gentlemen, Ron Heifetz and, um, and Dean Williams. And they define leadership as mobilizing people to face complex reality for the general progress and good of the group. And if you notice, the interesting distinction here is it's not about finding solutions and get, getting everybody to do things your way. It's about getting the team to do the work. It's much harder, but like uh, Anita said, it doesn't require official authority. You can do this from any level of the organization mm -hmm. through clever interventions. Um, I have some books I can recommend. <laughs> so I think one more question. You. I have a question for Anita. I'm a teacher in journalism in the Netherlands, and yeah. I'm wondering what you do in your curriculum uh, to uh, prepare students uh, yeah. well f for these two realities, actually. Yeah, thanks for that, that question. I just started this new new role. Um, and actually, part it's all about what we talked about now, because I felt, I, I really felt we need some new kind of leadership training in the industry, something that's more focusing on the questions that we are talking on about here, but also on providing leaders with the knowledge around you know, how to develop a product strategy, how to think about your audience, how to figure out the right uh, KPIs and, and uh, think how to think about scale and platforms. So what I'm building now and the first, um, the first course executive MA is starting January 2020, so I'm just in the face of building that, the curriculum will incorporate uh, a lot of topics around, um, around leadership and helping to refine yourself as a leader. So a lot about both the management skills as well as the kind of leadership skills you really need uh, to drive that transformation in a both more efficient way, but also in a more healthy way, uh, both for yourself and for the people you work with. We are done. We, I get the sign that, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it seems like there is a, you know, wow, we are on time here, uh, and we need to do some self care, which in Perugia means pasta and, and pizza and maybe wine even for lunch. So thank you all for being here and thanks for the great discussion.